Do you find the Bible difficult to understand? Is your spiritual walk at a standstill? Do you desire to take your spiritual walk to the next level? Growth in knowledge and understanding requires teaching. At Good Treasure Ministries, we teach the Bible in an applicatory fashion, using a systematic approach designed to bring understanding, which will produce real growth. Visit our website today at hisgoodtreasure.com. We have articles, a radio show, the podcast show, our TV show, and also music. Good Treasure Ministries, your place of spiritual learning. Hebrews, I'd like to have you go there with me. Hebrews chapter 6. Tonight I brought with me a book written by William Barclay, and I want to share something here at the outset with you. What we ultimately want to come to is listed here, beginning at verse 4 of this chapter. It's something that we have touched on at many different times through the years, and we'd like to study it out. And we'd like to begin here in Hebrews, the sixth chapter at verse 1. I wrote it down what I was going to call this tonight so that those that are taking care of labels for the taping, doctrines beginners should know. Those that are beginning in the faith, people that are just getting saved, just getting born again, information that they should know very early in their Christian walk with God. Uh, the Apostle Paul, and perhaps in order to expedite some time here, I'd like to read it from the Amplified Bible. I believe that the Apostle Paul wrote this. It harmonizes with his theology. I'm well convinced it was the Apostle Paul. There are those that believe it may have been Apollos, that it may have been some other writer. But I, I'm thoroughly convinced it was the Apostle Paul inspired by the Spirit of God. And as he is writing this letter to the Hebrew Christians, these are people that have the Jewish background. They had been, whether they were Jew and Gentile, could have been both Jew and Gentile, but they were from the Hebrew background. Like Paul referred to himself in the book of Philippians as a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Not everybody that was a part of the Hebrew faith was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. The thing that made him a Hebrew of the Hebrews was the fact that he was born into that religion. He, did, he, was, not, um, a, he was not a proselyte to the Jews' religion, but he was born into it. And so he referred to himself as a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So as he writes to these people, he's writing primarily to Jewish people, but he's also writing to Gentile people that had come from that Jewish background that had become proselytes to the Jews' religion. And there was a great danger of drift drifting back under Judaism. And so the Apostle Paul, a good portion of this letter, uh, actually the whole letter is to give them some insight so that they do not go back under Judaism. We have come to Mount Zion. We're not at Mount Sinai. We have come to the blood that speaks better things th than that of Abel. Uh, we have come to a better covenant. And we've come to a better priest, a better high priest. We've come to a better apostle. We've come to everything that's better, according to this book of Hebrews. So here in, in chapter 6, he says, therefore, let us go on and get past the elementary stage in the teachings and doctrine of Christ, advancing steadily toward the completeness and perfection that belong to spiritual maturity. Let us not again be laying the foundation of repentance and abandonment of dead works, dead formalism, and of the faith by which you turned to God, with teachings about purifying the laying on of hands, the resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment and punishment. These are all matters of which you should have been fully aware long, long ago. So the things that he lists here, beginning in verse 1, he wants them to understand these are things that they were introduced to when they first came to Christ, but these are things that they should have been able to move on from. 
The only time they should be lingering with these things is if they're trying to help someone else that, are, that has newly come to the faith to bring them through these uh, uh, elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, in the latter part of the sixth chapter, the apostle helps us to see something very clear about where these people are spiritually. I brought this book tonight because there is a statement in here that, that has followed me ever since I read it a few years ago from the pen of William Barclay. And he says, here he is face to face with a problem which haunts the church in every generation, that of the Christian who refuses to grow up. That haunts the Christian church in every generation, the Christian who refuses to grow up. There are people in the body of Christ that are just totally unwilling to grow up. In recent times, in recent times, it has been coming across my mind a great deal. And in addition to that thought, it has carried me back to a teaching that I heard or, or read from uh, Moore Cirillo. Moore Cirillo of, is of Jewish background. He came to know Christ as, at an early age, was visited by the Lord himself, actually stands in the office of an apostle. And this man made a declaration, and the first time I heard it was back in the 70s, where he said that all truth is parallel. The truth that is happening in our physical, tangible world, the world that we are able to look at and handle, the truth that we see out here in this world is running parallel with truth that is happening in the world of the spirit. And in connection with that statement, I want you to consider something with me. And this is not to embarrass anyone by any means. But because all truth is parallel, we can learn from natural things about spiritual things. Now, it's no problem with many things in the natural if we don't change. But there is a problem if we are a certain way in the natural and we allow that certain natural tendency to control us as far as our spiritual life and our spiritual walk with God is concerned. We learn how to, to talk as a result of being around people that talk. As a child growing up in the South, there were words that I would hear, and, and, and just to give you some insight as to how my mind operates, and it still operates this way. Through the years, especially when I started going to school, <laughs> learned um, how to read and write through the system of phonics, when people would talk, I would take words that I had never heard before and I would break them down into syllables and I would spell them in my mind. And in spelling those words, I'm sure it helped me as far as schooling was concerned. But there were a lot of words that I, I didn't know. I mean, I heard people say certain words. Just to give you an example, when I was around 10, 11 years of age, I'm still hear hearing this expression, I'll be there directly. I'll be there directly. And I thought they were saying the directly. I'll be there the directly. And I had run it through my mind for years trying to spell that, trying to decipher it, trying to figure it out. I knew what it meant, I knew they meant they'll be there shortly. I'm, I'm on my way, something to that effect. But I couldn't figure out what they were really trying to say. And then one day it dawned on me. They're saying directly. I'll be there directly. Now, if, if we're brought up in that kind of environment and uh, where people are not educated or have limited education, their diction is not completely right, if a person grows up into adulthood, their addiction pretty much remains that way. Unless a person chooses to go back to school, be tutored and trained to help. I know of a certain individual, a good friend of mine, has a, a number of years over me, that went back to school for that very purpose. He felt that if he was going to represent God, he needed to be at his very best. He needed to be able to communicate, to be able to speak, where people could understand him. And uh, I could understand him. I, you know, I, I was 
brought up around that kind of language, that kind of talk. But I'm sure I, I've talked with people from other countries and I've asked them, have you ever gone south? And I say, and I, I've asked them, have you had a problem with the accent? And many of them have said, yes, I've had a problem. I have to ask over and over, could you repeat it? Could you say it again? Because I'm not capturing what you're, what you're saying. And not always is it just the, the southern drawl, but many times it is the pronunciation of words, or should I say the mispronunciation of words. Now, in the natural, there's, there's no real problem with that. We have certain gifts, we may have certain talents, certain abilities. We might even go to school, get a degree, and still have a problem as far as diction and grammar is concerned, and get out into the workforce. Uh, I read something from one of the, from a person that works in the New Haven school system, how the person has a job. In, 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 in the, the school system, I don't know, but just reading some material that he wrote and passed on to be brought home, I thought, certainly this man could not have gone to college, but in order to have the position he has, he went to college, he has a degree, and so depending on the circle you're in, many times that circle will accommodate you regardless of, of how you speak or even how you write. Now, what we have done is we have, we have, we've accepted that out here in the natural world. We go on and we love people, we accept people. And then we have transferred that over into the church world, over into the spiritual world, where if in our spiritual growth and in our spiritual development, during the early days, the early stages of our walk with Jesus Christ, Whatever we are exposed to, many times, that's the way we remain all of our Christian walk. If we become, if, if we are exposed, if I may put it this way, if we are exposed to spiritual ignorance during the early stages of our walk, if we're exposed to something that is not going to produce growth and spiritual development, we'll fall in love with it and we'll just settle into that and we don't do anything to shake ourselves, to arouse ourselves, to arise and go on and get something more and something better from God. As it happens in the natural, it also happens just because it's that way in the natural doesn't mean it's going to be that way for us in the spiritual, but many times it is that way. We need to grow. We need to develop spiritually. Amen. There ought to constantly be a hunger and a thirst. And I'm not talking about for knowledge, for the sake of having knowledge. But I'm talking about serious spiritual growth and development where you move on from the elementary stages of Christianity. Now let me give you a quick example of a person that is remaining in the elementary stages of the Christian, Christian development. When we are constantly hanging around the realm of repentance, when we are hanging around simply faith toward God on an elementary plane, when we are constantly dealing with people about getting baptized in water all the time, and I have heard sermons on radio from the same minister week after week, after week, after week, after week on Acts 2.38. You know what Acts 2.38 says? In Acts 2.38 it says that we are to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I can see Billy Graham doing that if Billy Graham chose to do that because Billy Graham is an evangelist. He's preaching salvation to people. He's preaching to them to come to know Jesus Christ, to enter into this thing at ground level. But in the realm of the church, if that's all we're hearing every week, I mean, I, might, I, I could start off somewhere else talking about something else, but if I end up with the bulk of my sermon, sermon coming to Acts 2.38, I am causing the people to become spiritually stunted as far as their spiritual growth and development is concerned. 
So in the realm of the spirit, if we are exposed to certain things pertaining to prayer, pertaining to praise, to worship, pertaining to the overall view of, of the Word of God, if I'm not very careful, that thing can stunt my spiritual growth. I can say, hallelujah, glory to God. On the other hand, I can reject something else that's coming new altogether because I can't see it. I don't see my need for that kind of thing. And we as believers, we have to be willing to go on to perfection. We have to go on to maturity. I want to learn how to talk better as a Christian. Whether my diction ever improves in the natural, now I'd like for it to improve in the natural, but whether it ever improves in the natural or not, as far as spiritual diction is concerned, it ought to improve. I ought to be able to tell you about deeper things of God. Like the Apostle Paul, when he speaks here about the man Melchizedek, notice in this fifth chapter, At verse 10, called of God and high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now he wants to talk to these people about Melchizedek. He recognizes that what he's about to share with them is difficult to break down that they can comprehend it because of where they are spiritually. He refers to them at verse 11 again as being dull of hearing, dull of hearing. Let me share what's going on in the church world. And actually, I'm getting off course. I didn't want to do this tonight. But let me share with you what's going on in the church world. All truth is parallel. When you, when you go to the supermarket, you can come to certain products that simply, that says pure whatever. Praise and worship today is something that God has brought alive again, has raised from the dead, if you will, are moving away from dry formalism, praise and worship, and yet praise and worship today is being contaminated. Men have laid hold on it, and men are working praise and working worship and handling it and controlling it and, and making men move with their brand of praise and their brand of worship, and the Holy Spirit has had to step away from it. It's no longer His. Notice here in, in Leviticus chapter 19. At verse 19, ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Was that written altogether for the cattle's sake or for our sake? For our sake, no doubt. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed, neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. All of these things speak to us of the pureness that God wants in the body of Christ. And yet we have mingled seed, the doctrines of men with a little bit of the doctrines of God mingle together. And therefore, the product is not as healthy, it's not as strong, it's diseased, it's weak, it's inferior. 
God has a superior product for his people. As the scripture says, in, in uh, Jesus is speaking, he says, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Amen. And this violence many times has to do with our own flesh. It has to do with our own mind, our own way of thinking. It has to be corralled. It has to be brought under and brought, subjection, uh, brought into subjection to the spirit. As the Bible says in the book of Romans, the carnal mind is at enmity against God. It in no way can please God, according to the Apostle Paul. And so God is looking for a pure product. All these things that are spoken of here in the book of, of Leviticus, the mingling and carrying on, uh, some of the stuff sounds hard from God's vantage point. Uh, you, you, you consider the scripture where God says that the person that is, uh, is it a eunuch? Cannot come into the congregation to the 10th generation. The eunuch cannot come. I mean, that's a strong, hard word. Cannot come into the congregation. Go, to, go with me momentarily to the book of Isaiah. And I'm already off. So I, I'll just go off a little further. In Isaiah, did I say 54? Look in 52. Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. From the very beginning, I've wanted God's best. Nothing less. I've wanted God's best. And when I was in, in my travels out west, as I viewed different things, there were certain things I saw and, I, and my heart embraced it. And there were certain other things that my heart just totally rejected. And many times if we are walking a road and no one else is talking what we're hearing on the inside and, and no one else is speaking of what we're seeing. Sometimes there is a shying away from what God is showing and what God is appointing at a given time in our experience because nobody else is doing it. Nobody else seemed to be embracing it. And it's like you're going upstream, you're going against the current, against the tide. And do you know that in Christianity, pure Christianity, you're always going against the tide? Amen. Any dead fish can flow downstream. Look here in Isaiah, the 52nd chapter. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. No more. The uncircumcised, the unclean will no... Now he's not talking about with the nation of Israel. He's not talking about Judaism. He is predicting what's going to happen in the greater Israel, the greater Jerusalem, in the church that in the body of Christ, there will not, absolutely will not be any uncircumcised or unclean. The wheat and the tares, they grow together. But that doesn't make the tares in the kingdom. They don't belong to God. So the uncircumcised and the unclean, they may be in the outer church, the external church, but they're not in the real church. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for, for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Did you hear that prophetic word earlier? <laughs> yes. Amen. I am. Hallelujah. 
has sent you. At verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. They shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Everybody that's naming the name of Christ is not seeing eye to eye. Not everyone is seeing the same thing. We have people seeing different things, motivated by different things. But they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go out uh, by flight, for the Lord will go out before you, and the God of Israel will be your re reward. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. And this is talking about Jesus. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astunned at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. This passage here is predictive. Isaiah is pro uh, prophesying about the coming days, the days of the church, the days of the evangelist, the days in which the gospel message is going to get out, the days in which there is going to be a definite line drawn God's people is going to depart out of the world is going to no longer touch the unclean thing and be clean in bearing the vessels of the Lord now I don't know how clear I was with that illustration that I gave but we can examine our own lives we know where we sister Mays you came from a Roman Catholic Church she could have continued to embrace only what she learned in the Roman Catholic Church and no more. My mother and father came from Pilgrim Baptist Church. And I remember as a child the way that we worshipped, the way that we praised God during the services. And they're different from the way that we sing in praise here in this assembly. And that's not to put them down by any means. Uh, when it came to the songs, we sang the hymns, but they weren't sung like we sing them out of the hymn book, except occasionally. If we sang Amazing Grace, they would do it by long meter, common meter, or short meter. And uh, they would outline the hymn, and then if it was long meter, it would really be drug out long. If it was short meter, they kind of sped through the song. And when it came to prayer, I remember in one church I was in, the pastor, whenever he prayed, it was the same prayer. In so much that most of us, I shouldn't say most of us, but a lot of us learn that heart, prayer by heart. But my parents were upward and aggressive people. You would have thought that we were brought up in a Pentecostal church, in a full gospel church, charismatic church. They were readers of the Bible. They saw things that the other folks in the church didn't see. I remember overhearing their conversations. They kept a lot of things from us. I found out a lot more after I got older. And I thank God they kept a lot of that stuff from me. I probably would have been so turn, uh, put out with church that I probably wouldn't even be in church. But they saw in the Bible salvation. 
They saw holy living in the Bible. They saw healing for today, miracle working power of God for today. They read every day, at least as far as I could see, every day, every night, they had their Bibles open, reading the Bible. But then we have a bunch of people that are spoon-fed. All they know is what the preachers told them. And even when they make a move from one assembly to another, they're still not willing to learn. They're still embracing whatever they were first exposed to. In the natural, people don't learn how to move on with their education and grow up. In the spiritual world, people don't know how to move on and grow up in the things of God. And the Apostle Paul is giving strong warning here to this people. It's not enough to begin. You've got to finish the race in order to obtain the prize. Now go back with me to the book of Hebrews. I want to read this from the pen of Barclay. Here the writer to the Hebrews deals with the difficulties which confront him in attempting to get across an adequate conception of Christianity to his hearers. He is confronted with two difficulties. First, the full orb of the Christian faith is by no means an easy thing to grasp, nor can it be learned in a day. Second, the hearing of the hearers is dull. The word he uses, nothros, is full of meaning. It means slow moving in mind, torpid in understanding, dull of hearing, witlessly forgetful. Witlessly forgetful, slow moving in mind. I remember dealing with a lady about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We shared the word with her, we laid hands on her, and as soon as we laid hands on her, she started to shake and she fell on the floor. I said, get her up. We don't need her falling down on the floor, we want to get her full of the Holy Ghost. So the brothers got her up, I said, sister, calm down. I said, just relax. We prayed with her again, she started to shake and she fell on the floor again. We never got her through that. She got baptized in the Holy Spirit a few weeks later, but that initial experience because of what she had seen you get locked in we get locked in we have to be emotional if we're going to receive anything from God we got to fall on the floor we've got to foam at the mouth we've got to we got to roll up and down the aisles we've got to do something remember Wayne uh, Wayne um, his last name slips my mind when we were on Hazel Street this brother went down to New York, wanted to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He goes to this woman's house. She's, I guess, uh, uh, I'm sure she considered herself a minister of the gospel. And she had this veil that separated the room. She had certain things going on in one room and certain things going on in the other room. So in the back room, she had those that wanted to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So she had them in there, gave them instructions, and they had to say, Jesus, 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 over and over and over again. And, and, and there were other things that they were instructed to do. And finally, uh, when, when the lady goes in to check on them, she says, she says, you're never going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because you're not ugly enough. You've got to get ugly if you're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Spiritual ignorance that people latch on to, hold on to it, and are unwilling to turn it loose and move on. Listen, it's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. On the day of Pentecost, the people, 120, were gathered at the command of the Lord. Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. I believe they knew, I believe they knew that they were not going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost. I believe they knew that. Just as Christ died there at Passover, fulfilling Passover, the Holy Spirit came to fulfill the giving of the law at Mount Sinai to fulfill their gathering at Mount Sinai 50 days after the Passover. 
These people are, the scripture doesn't say they were kneeling, doesn't say their hands were raised, doesn't say they were making a loud noise. The scripture says they were all seated. They were all in one accord, in one place. And the Holy Spirit suddenly began to make a mighty sound, the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. That exhortation that Sister White gave earlier in the prayer meeting, that was the Lord speaking to us about our comfort zone. And God wants to bring about change. He wants to elevate us, bring us to a higher place in Him. I'm going to talk about this again perhaps real soon. But through the years when it has come to the prayer meetings and, and, and to our regular services, we don't always praise the same way. I don't know whether you've ever picked that up or not. But not everybody can enter in the same way. So we, we, we enter in in different ways. Sometimes we kind of sing along our praise. Just kind of sing it out. Sometimes we shout it out. Sometimes we just speak it out. But there is a door of entrance for everybody. Someone was speaking to me the other day. They've been with us now for 20 years. They said, I still haven't been able to, to sing it out. I, have, I still haven't been able to get released in that area to be able to sing out that tune. I didn't know that that tune came from the Latter Rain Movement. Brother Campbell informed me of that when he was perhaps around the first time when he was with us. He said to me, he said that that praise that you do that came out of the Latter Rain Movement. It was not around before the Latter Rain Movement. The Spirit of God brought that into the church during the Latter Rain Movement. I was exposed to it out west. And why did I adapt? See, I don't do things without thinking. I wanted, when I was first saved, I wanted to praise God. I felt compelled. I wanted to worship God. I hadn't even read the scripture where it says, Rejoice evermore and in everything give thanks. I hadn't read that. Where there's a command that it should be continual. I had read in the Psalms about praise. But somehow as a newborn child of God, I felt that should be a part of my life. Praise and worship to God. Not idle time. Not idle thoughts. But praise and worship flowing out of me God ward all day long doesn't mean I can't interact with people I can talk with people I can receive instructions I was a student in high school at the time I could hear what the teacher had to say but then when all that's over and I don't have to study I can go back to musing and, and fellowshipping and meditate whatever with God. The scripture says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Be filled with the Spirit. That's a sign of a Spirit-filled life. Amen. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Constant fellowship with God. And so, Getting saved and some of the songs that we sang, I couldn't sing those songs during the day. They were fine in church, but for some reason I couldn't get into them during the day. I tried. And then the songs that I could get into, they only had a few words, just a chorus. And so you sing it through about 10, 15 times and you've worn it out. So I wanted to learn the hymns and I wanted to learn the choruses. I wanted to make it a part of me, something that I would be doing and fellowshipping with God, songs that had meaning. I even questioned the songs. John Garlington, Brother Garlington's father, uh, brother, the one that was killed in the car accident, I only heard one sermon by him and when I heard the sermon, I wept. And I said, God, why? Would a man of his caliber that has such a handle on the word 
that's so serious, dedicated, committed, not simply being religious and leading people religiously through life, but a man that had a working relationship and a working knowledge of the Word of God. How is it that this man is taken from this life so young when there are so many others that we could do without? Now that sounds like a hard thing <laughs> to ask, but there are those that we could do without. They're not saying anything not doing anything with the people of God. How can you grow? How can you develop when there's no food to eat? John Garlington told of having come to this, it was a church of God, and when he arrived, he said they had all kinds of monuments propped up and all kinds of pillars set up in the church. And he told them when he arrived, he said to them, after he'd been there for a while, he said, I'm not going to touch anything, but I'm going to test everything. And all these pillars that you've got set up in this assembly, I'm going to see what it's holding up. And if it's not holding up anything, I'm going to knock it over. <laughs> see, we set up a lot of things that looks Right sounds right, religious, God's nowhere near it. Do you realize, I, at least from my perspective, most of the praise and the worship that goes on in the church world is just an empty sound, just a noise. Of course, the Bible does say make a joyful noise, but there ought to be substance it ought to be from the heart. And I'll tell you why I feel that way. Because it would bring the power of God to God's people if it was real. Yeah. It would bring healing. It would bring miracles. It would bring changed lives. It would bring conviction. It wouldn't be only in the church house. But you'd find it following the people when they leave the church house. Amen. Sunday morning's worship service here. I was in, it was alive. I was in orbit when I left here. All day, all night, all Monday. Then the devil, I knew the devil sent that guy along to try to steal it from me yesterday. I felt like I had just come to the end of convocation. Ah. I talked with Brother Richard Furlow uh, Sunday night. We talked for, I guess, a couple hours. We had church out on the sidewalk. Then we talked. I talked with Brother Greg Roberts. He was on fire. That young man came by my house and he looked in my mailbox and got my name so he could act like he knew, who, he knew me. Con artist. That troubled me. I knew it was the adversary. I knew it was the adversary. But when there is real praise and there is real worship, and I'm not talking about us screaming. To, let me share something else with you. All this noise we make in the body of Christ, all this screaming we do. You don't know the number of preachers that have had to have throat operations because of their hard preaching. You think that's God? That's not God. That's not God. If you're destroying your throat, oh, but I'm anointed. When the anointing comes on me, I have to scream and I have to yell an hour. If you're destroying your throat, that's not God. And we all, resp I mean, we all get, I shouldn't say all of us, some of us may not get too loud, but you get emotional. There's a time for emotion, but what we have done is we have substituted we have taken the emotion and have closed our eyes to what is genuinely spiritual, which what is really of God. God can come in in such a quiet move, just a hush. I remember one night when I left service in Miracle Valley, I went to my room that night and I wanted to open my mouth and praise God. And it was as if he put his hand over my mouth. And I laid there in awe. 
I remember waiting after the service, waiting so everybody else could leave, so I wouldn't have to talk to anyone. I had been in the presence of God. He was so near to me that while I'm kneeling at the altar, when I felt they're going to have to lock the doors eventually, and I'm waiting, and after everyone is just about gone, I got up. I got up. And I went across campus. I slipped into the dormitory, slipped into my room and shut the door and bowed in his presence. Couldn't say a word, couldn't open my mouth. See, the Holy Ghost moves with great diversity, but we've got him locked in. We know, we know how the Holy Ghost moves and we, knows what, we know what he's looking for. We don't always know what the Holy Ghost is looking for. We have almost robbed the church of conviction today. Even when a preacher is preaching conviction, how many times have clapping been misplaced? Those old homosexuals, God wants them to be free. God wants them to be delivered. But if there's a homosexual sitting there hearing that, that clapping throws him off. These people are against me. They're applauding this man that's talking about the life that I live. How is it we can't respond? Oh, God, yes. God's able. God can deliver. Sermons of conviction gets applause. There is no room for it. Sermons of conviction don't need our applause. Sermons of convictions need people to drop to their knees. Yes. cry out to God. We're too busy praising. We're too busy worshiping. We've lost the ability to cry. We've lost the ability to weep before God. And if you start weeping, people think you're weak. They think that there's some sin in your life. Somebody's got to walk up to you, put their arm around your shoulder. Oh, God, help sister so-and-so. Help brother so-and-so. I told you about myself when we first got married. My wife's at the altar crying out for more of Jesus. This lady comes up and she says, Honey, God bless you. Being newly married, I know it's tough. <laughs> had nothing to do with me, had nothing to do with our marriage. This, we need discerning hearts. Discerning hearts. <laughs> I got completely off tonight. I want us to look at something here in the book of Hebrews, and, and perhaps we'll come to this um, the next time I have opportunity to minister. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next week is United Prayer Meeting. But the next time we have opportunity, there are stages of spiritual growth and stages of spiritual development in God. I'm at a place in God that if I ever walked away from him, it would be over. Some of you are there too. You may not know it, but you're there. You've tasted too much. You've seen too much. You've experienced too much. You back out now, it's over. You'll go to a devil's hell. You'll be lost eternally. But may I point out, most of the body of Christ is not there. And I'm not putting myself on some pedestal. I believe I'm just at the elementary stage of it. But there's a place in God that God wants us all at, where the wicked one touches us not. A place in God. I hope I didn't sound like Mingle Seed tonight with what I was sharing. I guess out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But there's a cry in my heart for the move of the Spirit of God. 
We want to control the Holy Ghost. We want to control what he does, everything that he does. We want, we, we, we got to somehow feel in charge. God help us. Remember last time when we were speaking, we were share, sharing out of Revelation chapter 12. We talked about God's wilderness. That's the place where he takes us for our protection. Spoken of in Revelation 12. And it talks about how the, the adversary goes after the woman, the church. And then it talks about how he then goes after her seed. He goes after individual believers. The enemy is on the prowl after the body of Christ to rob us of God's best. But there is a wilderness, a wilderness that God takes his people to. And from that wilderness, we operate with great power and great authority. And if I can get a handle on this for you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Perhaps I'll share along that line next time. Thank you, Lord. We sang a song. All for Jesus. All for Jesus. All my days and all my hours. All my words, all my doings. All my beings being ransom powered. Then the song speaks about looking at the crucified. Paul said, I'm determined in nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's another song that followed me after we had shared that night. The song is Beneath the Cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way from the burning of the noonday heat to the closing of the day. I take, O cross, thy shadow from my abiding place. I want no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss. The, re the rest of the words, they get away from me. But there, that song describes for us our coming apart from the world, being set apart solely for Jesus Christ, looking only at him, content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss, learning to be contented in whatever state we're in in this natural world, and pressing on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We're in God's wilderness. We are pilgrims and strangers simply passing through. This world is not our home and we need to stop acting like it is. God has to become first and foremost. We have to learn his ways. We have to, or this move of God this last day move of God will pass us by. The Holy Spirit will be moving on. The few here and the few there will be moving on with him. But those that are in the outer court, they'll remain there. But we need to enter in and remain in the inner court 
to move on with the glory of God. These days hold for us great power, great demonstration of the Spirit, the prophets, and I'm not simply talking about the prophets of the Bible. I'm talking also about modern day prophets have spoken about these days and what God has planned and purposed and is about to unleash upon the earth has begun to do it already in quarters here and there but God is going to do a phenomenal thing in these closing days and so it behooves us to recognize that our ways are not his ways our thoughts are not his thoughts for as high as heaven is above the earth so are our ways different from his ways and our thoughts from his our ways are different our thoughts are different but they don't have to remain different we can come to know the ways of God and flow with his ways he's not holding back anything from any of his children it is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom not a part of it but all of it the whole kingdom that applies to every aspect of life the priorities must be kept in order God must remain central first and foremost our duties and responsibilities pertaining to our wives our husbands our children our home life all of that is important all of that is significant if that is not as it ought to be it's going to affect us in our relationship with God and then it's going to affect us in fulfilling whatever ministry whatever call he wants for us in these last days and so we must we must establish we must establish our priorities make the Word of God an everyday part of your diet don't simply eat the grits and the eggs and the bacon and the ham and whatever else don't simply eat at lunchtime don't simply eat at dinner time to satisfy your hunger as far as this natural body is concerned but take care of your spiritual man feed him feed him feed him every day upon the Word of God even when you don't understand it feed the man the inner man with the Word of God and God will cause that food that spiritual food from his word to provide the strength the power the understanding the wisdom a wisdom that's not of this world that you won't even know how it came how you derived it what was it that caused you to see as you saw to hear as you heard but simply the Word of God the living Word of God hallelujah thank you father